I've worked on a lot of uh, ninja films throughout the year. And a lot of people having misconceptions, misinformation, misunderstanding, because there doesn't seem to be a definite origin or foundation or history of how American ninja production films uh, got started. So I'm, I've been listening to a lot of different things over the years and I finally uh, came to the idea that I would like to tell my version of how this all began and maybe we can clear up a lot of misconceptions that people have. My martial arts career actually started when I was in a junior in high school with Aikido. But my interest in martial arts movies, uh, samurai movies, started pretty much when I was a freshman in high school. Uh, so ever since then, I've really got interested in uh, my first, my first karate movie was called Denko Karate Uchi. And um, I, I was a freshman in, in high school then at La Hain Luna. And after seeing the movie, I was so motivated and inspired by it that I pretty much ran the rest of the way up because we had what's called a border's field. There was about a three foot platform that was used on, uh, on a grass field that was part of our practice football field. And that was used as the stage whenever we had graduation, that that's where the graduation ceremony was held outdoors. And it was a three foot platform. And when I got home uh, to, the, to the school, I practiced doing a flying sidekick that I saw done in the movie. And that became the start of my, my fascination with flying sidekicks and then with samurai movies with swords and everything. So when it came to uh, the filming, my interest was already at an all time high. My interest in ninja was already very much entrenched in my mind. I had moved to Las Vegas in 1975 and when I was there I taught karate during the day. I had a small karate school but at night I was a dealer for blackjack at one of the casinos, the Tropicana Hotel. And as it happened one of my first students that uh, came to my school in Las Vegas was a guy named Bob Jones. And Bob Jones was a very interesting character. Uh, we got along very well because he was a little bit unorthodox. But ever since I went to Las Vegas, about 1977, 78, I started to work for Engelbert Humperdinck as his fitness instructor, his karate instructor, and as his bodyguard. It's supposed to be a six month tour throughout Canada and the US, but it ended up uh, working with him for about two and a half years. But at the end of that period of time, maybe 1978 or so, I was already there three years. Uh, Bob Jones was a very good friend and one day he kept telling me, you know Mike, you don't belong here in Las Vegas. This is not the place for you to live. He said, really what you should do, I've heard of all of your ideas and the things that you've done and what you'd like to do and I really think you should move out of Las Vegas and go back to Los Angeles and write this script you're telling me about. So I said, yeah, maybe someday. He said, no, no, you're the one always talking about positive attitude and do it now and everything. So. I'm coming back to you with your own words and say you should do it now. You should leave Las Vegas. Well, that went on for about another six months. He's bugging me all the time. Then one day he came up to me and he said, Mike, listen, I'm having a, a surprise birthday party actually. It's kind of like a surprise. I know it. It's my birthday and I'm going to have it at my apartment tonight at about seven o'clock. So I'd like to invite you for you to come to it. So I said, sure, I'd be glad to. But I was thinking already, even before I went there, I was showering at home and decided to go a little bit early. And I was thinking, oh, wait a minute, it's not Bob's birthday. I wonder why he said that, you know, that's not like him. So anyway, I went to his apartment. On the bottom floor, I looked up to where his apartment was on the second floor. And there was no security light outside the doorway. Where he's, he's a very big guy on security and personal security. So I was wondering why the, the light was on. And it was dark and I couldn't see any lights coming through the drapes or anything like that. So I hesitated about going up thinking he wasn't there. Then another part of me said, oh, just since you're here, just go up and check. So I walked up and just as I was approaching the top of the stairs, I called out his name several times and there was no answer. And I was going, huh, that's really weird. 
So I even went to the door, I knocked on a couple of times and said, hey, Bob, yo, Bob, Mike, still no answer. So I tried to look between the crack where I could, if there was any light coming through from the inside, there were no lights on. So I was going, man, this is really strange. Then I got it, did he make a mistake or what happened? So I decided to leave. As I turned and just took maybe the first step down the stairway to leave, I heard the door open behind me. And I was like really curious because I knew there was nobody inside. So I turned around and I saw Bob was on his knees in the doorway, so his eye level was about the doorknob high. And he had the, the door open wide enough that he could stick his head out and he was looking up and down the hallway of the, the apartment as if, you know, is everything safe? Is, are we safe here? And even I did the same thing. I kind of mirrored him and it was like, what's going on? I said, what is, what, what's going on, Bob? What's, what's up? And he said, come in here. And very suspicious like, you know, so I kind of snuck over and then I noticed he didn't even put the light on in his apartment. So he was kind of like in the dark. But as I approached him, he stood up and turned his back to the door jam and opened the rest of the door. And just as I approached the door to step in, he switched on the light. And there was a chorus of voices that said, safe trip. And there were a group of guys, about four guys, kneeling on the, or sitting on the floor in a circle. And in the middle of the circle, there was my name spelled out in $100 bills, Mike Stone. And then I said, Bob, what's, what, what is it? What's going on? He said, well, Mike, I couldn't keep a secret to tell you the truth. So I'm sorry, I had to tell them. And I was really confused what he's talking about. He said, what do you mean you had to tell them? I said, you know, you know the secret that you told me not to tell anybody? I said, and what was the secret? He said that you're moving back to Los Angeles. I said, really? And he said, yes, so we all decided to get some money together as a going away gift. So this is our going away party for you. And I was just dumbfounded. So this is Bob Jones. So in the next couple of weeks, as I was preparing to honor his deal to leave Las Vegas, I moved back to Las Vegas. But before I left, we had a conversation. I said, listen, he said, Mike, go back and write your script. And the script at that time I had was called Dance of Death. That was the title I had for it. Uh, he said, write your script. That's what you should be doing. That, that is your life. You should be doing that. Do the choreography, do all the martial arts stuff, because I know that's your passion. So you should do that. So I said, okay, I tell you what, Bob, I'll make you a promise. That when I get the script written and sold, and we're going to go into production. Now, I'm really very naive and stupid at this point, obviously, but dreaming still. I said, when I do that, I'll make sure you're one of the five guys that I take with as my team of martial artists to do the fight scenes and everything like that. And that happened. That became a reality. <laughs>